Good morning, Cornerstone Church. Let's come on. Get up out of our seats. Let's worship our God together in this house. Come on.
Hey, Cornerstone Church, my name is McQuaid and this is Tristan. And we're so glad that you guys decided to come to church this weekend. If it is your first time here, go ahead and grab this Connect card. It's going to be right on the front pocket in front of... The seat pocket. The seat pocket. If it's your first time here, go ahead and grab this Connect card, which is going to be on the seat pocket in front of you. We'd love to have you fill it out, turn it in at the offering bucket in the back of the sanctuary. We'd love to get connected with you, get to know your name, and meet you. Young adults, get ready for our spring service on April 21st at 7 p.m. Come expecting food, games, worship, and time to hang out with our friends. This service will be featuring guest speaker Preston Smith. If you are 18 to 30 years old and are not plugged in here at the church, come on out. Preston Smith is a great speaker. I'm excited for you guys to hear him. He's awesome. We've had him for our youth services. Uh, he's a great preacher, and he's going to bring an awesome message. Be there. Also, join us for Mother's Day weekend services on Saturday, May 11th at 5 p.m. Sunday, May 12th at both the 9 a.m. and 1045 services. We'll have a cute photo booth. That's pretty sweet. We love uh, cute. 
We love cute stuff. We're gonna have a photo booth available for you to take pictures with your family and friends. Each mother will also receive a small gift to take home. We'd love to have you join us and help celebrate all the special moms in our lives. We love moms. Kids Camp is happening June 10th through the 13th for kids going into grades 3rd through 5th at Lake Geneva Christian Center in Alexandria, Minnesota. Camp is a week packed full of friendship, fun, and most importantly, time growing in relationship with God. The price is $340. Scholarships are available at the Info Center. This is an awesome investment for your child that will impact their... to my own faith in Jesus Christ. And 
Uh, when I came to faith in, in Christ, then the wheels started turning spiritually in greater capacity in my life, and I realized that I needed to take this step of water baptism to follow Christ in obedience. And there are those across this room today, you were maybe baptized as a baby, but you have not made the decision to be baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 16, he said, believe and be baptized. And so this is our decision of faith that, that we are making. And so we are making this declaration that my life used to be, <clears throat> excuse me, about me, but now my life is about Jesus. And so that's what uh, those who are being baptized next weekend are saying with the act of water baptism. So Jesus, you are Lord of my life. And so I encourage you, get up there and be a part of that. Also coming up uh, two weeks after that, May 4th and 5th, the first weekend of May, uh, we, ha we have Dr. Carolyn Tennant here speaking in all of our weekend services. And Dr. Tennant uh, is former vice president of North Central University. Uh, she, has, she, she travels uh, the world, actually, talking about revival. And she is one of the foremost revival historians of our day. And so you will want to be here on May 4th or 5th uh, in those weekend services uh, be a part of that, because as she talks and teaches on this, there is just um, a really captivating essence of the Spirit of God that, that just seems to just travel along with her. And so uh, this is just a special time, a special season at Cornerstone Church, and I encourage you uh, to, to get here and be a part of that. Put that on your calendar today. Today, we <clears throat> excuse me, head into a new collection of messages for the next few weeks from John chapter 4. And the title of uh, the series is Come and See Jesus. Did anybody come to church today to see Jesus, to meet with Jesus, to experience Jesus, to get closer to Jesus? Okay, there's three of us. Come on, did somebody come to church to meet with Jesus today? And so in John chapter 4, we, we see this incredible exchange. It's the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. And it is a beautiful interaction. I love this passage. I love this exchange. I love the transformation in her life. I love the way that Jesus just, just works in this situation, in this setting, in this woman's life. And just a quick pop quiz for you this morning. What are we about at Cornerstone Church? Somebody shouted at me. We're about one more person fully. Oh, that was just for anybody who was taking a nap already today, okay? But uh, we want to help one more live fully alive in Jesus Christ. That's what we want to do. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like we are on a path of knowing God, of finding freedom, of discovering purpose, and making a difference all in Jesus Christ. And so we want to be on that journey and uh, living in the fullness of Christ and that's what we see happening in this episode in John chapter 4 with Jesus and the woman at the, the well. And so I believe there are some lessons here for us in this story that will help us to grow in our encounters with others that can bring about spirit-led transformation in others, but also as we step out in this and we step out in faith, and belief of what God can do in a conversation, in a friendship, in an interaction, that we are also changed in the midst of it. And so I want us today to look at what happens with Jesus. And we're going to start towards the end of the story in John 4. I encourage you to go home and read the whole chapter uh, today sometime. And then we're going to be in John chapter 4 again next week and in the weekend after but we're going to start today at the end, towards the end of the story, and we're going to rewind all the way back to the start. But I want us to, to look at this story today with the end in mind. And so John chapter 4, verse 28, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come and see a man. Come and see Jesus. Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the Savior? I think he's the Savior. That's how she's saying it. That's the expression she's using here. 
They came out of the town and made their way toward him. I love that. My prayer is that we would be a people that when we have exchanges with others, that people would be coming towards Jesus, that they would be seeing Jesus. And so <clears throat> as, we, as we look at this, we see that this woman experiences life change. There are a lot of different things that, that we're going to talk about in the weeks to come uh, because we don't know all the answers about her life, but we, we have this picture that it is probable and likely that this was a woman who was hurting this was a woman who maybe had been discarded by men. We don't know the reasons for sure. It could be because she was unable to bear a child. It could be because, she, because there was immorality involved, either on the husband's part or on her part. And, and Jesus talks to her about that in the conversation, that she's had five husbands. And, and we'll talk about that in later days, but we... We, we get this sense that this woman is hurting. And Jesus, as he interacts with her, he deposits hope. Anybody thankful that Jesus is a God of hope? Amen. Now, I don't know where you are today. I don't know what's going on in your house, in your health in future decisions that you're making, in hurts that you're walking through. But I do know this, that Jesus is a God of hope. And he wants to meet with us. And he wants to live in us. And he wants to live through us. And so that's what we see in this story, now I want us to rewind back to the beginning, <clears throat> John chapter 4, verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. Make just a check mark there. As we look at that, now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. And so what we see happening here is the first thing in your notes, if you got some notes when you walked in this morning, and you want to do fill-ins or take some notes, the first thing is this, Jesus takes spirit-led steps. I know when we think about Jesus and his life and everything that he did, we think he's Jesus, he's God, he's divine, and yes, he is, he's fully God and fully man. And also, everything that he did, he did in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. And so we read here in verse 4, <clears throat> now he had to go through Samaria. Now, I know that you are used to, at Cornerstone Church, an incredible level of sophistication and technology. Amen. We stop at nothing. And so I have for you today the John, the Dave Simerson version of the John Madden whiteboard. Okay? It's right here. Okay? This is Dave's version of the Madden whiteboard. And so... Imagine with me, if you would, that this hand is <clears throat> the nation of Israel. And so when Jesus is leaving his previous location to when he was uh, at the well with a woman in Sychar in Samaria, he was kind of down around here. Now the Jordan River runs along here, and Perea is over here, and uh, the sea is over here, okay? And, and so... When Jesus is going to Judea up here, kind of up over here, Samaria and Sychar is right in the center of it all. So that would be the direct route, and that would make sense that that's the route that he would take, except for, for this 
reality that Jesus was Jewish. And that in Samaria, which was this region here in the center, Samaria was full of Samaritans. And there was a massive racial divide between Jews and Samaritans. They they hated each other. Jews despised Samaritans. I know that we think about the Samaritan story, the good Samaritan. We've probably all heard that phrase before at some point. But Good Samaritan is not something that was a reality. That's kind of the irony of the story of the Good Samaritan is because as Jesus was telling it to Jews, there's like, there's no such thing as a Good Samaritan. They're they're scum to us. They're the lowest of the low to us. It would be like saying, brilliant Green Bay Packer fan, okay? It's, It's the two just don't compute for a lot of people, all right? I think I heard some amens, and I'm going to ask security to escort those people out of the building, all right? But there's this this divide between the Jews and the Samaritans, and it was ethnic, and it was religious, and there was a lot of animosity and hostility, and so this was not a safe route for Jews to take. There There were safety issues involved, and it was just not a direction that they would go. It was a dirty, unwelcoming place, not safe for Jews. And so oftentimes what would happen is instead of taking the direct route, Jews would either uh, (coughs) cut over across across the Jordan River to Perea, and then they would go up, and then they would come over to, to Judea. Or they would go over to the coastal region, and they would go up the coastline, and then they would cut over. But almost never would they go straight through Samaria because of the tension that existed. And so we read here in verse 4, now Jesus had to go through Samaria. And Jesus had to go through Samaria... Not because he had to, but because he had to. Are you tracking with me? He was compelled to take these spirit-led steps through Samaria, through the unwelcome territory, through the unsafe territory, through the dirty place, through the people that Jews don't like, through the people that Samara, passing by, all the Samaritans, as they look at the Jews and they think, oh, we don't like you, and they shout things, and, and there's back and forth. Jesus had to go through Samaria, not because he had to, but because he had to. Have you, have you ever experienced something in your walk with God where you had to go a certain way, you had to have a certain conversation, you had to take a certain step, not because you had to, but because you had to. Because you're compelled by a sense of the Spirit of God in your life. You see, these were the steps that Jesus was taking, and you know what? As Jesus cooperated with the Spirit of God, so you and I can live lives of cooperation and obedience with the Spirit of God because of Jesus, because of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, the truth of God's Word, all of these things converging and interacting within our lives. We can walk in the Spirit of God and we can take Spirit-led steps every day. Why don't we do that? There's probably a million different reasons why we don't do that. But I think that probably one of the biggest reasons we don't, and I'll just say this, I'm not preaching this at you today. I wish I had all this down and perfected and dialed, but I'm still working on it. I'm still growing. And I think that probably one of the biggest reasons we don't, or maybe one of the biggest reasons I don't, is because we can get so locked in on doing our 
I've got my thing to do. And uh, <clears throat> Pastor Greg Laurie, he says, instead of walking in the Spirit, many Christians are sleepwalking. You ever sleepwalk? Some of you here probably sleepwalk. I don't really do it anymore, but I used to sleepwalk actually a fair amount. And I've passed that on to my son, Caleb, and he's a maniac in his sleep. He does crazy things in his sleep. But we, we sleepwalk in a sense that we're not awakened and we're not tuned in to the steps that the Spirit wants us to, to take because we're tuned in on our flesh. And so we wake up in the morning and we sleepwalk our way to the coffee pot, but that's anointed of God, okay? Let's just get that straight right now. But then once we get past coffee, then all of a sudden we, you know, we do our routine and we, uh, we get in the car and we go to work, to the office, to the job site, to the classroom, or we, uh, we have our coffee and we take care of the kids. That's our, our work throughout the entire day and we're doing all the things at home with the kids and, or we, we're just sleepwalking through all the pressures of life and the problems and the appointments and the, the games and the tournaments and, and all these things. And, and as we're going through it all, we're just kind of sleepwalking our way through it like a zombie. And the whole time God is wanting us to take spirit-led steps. Have you ever been rerouted by the Holy Spirit? Or do you ever allow the Holy Spirit to plan your route, to plan your day, your schedule, your place, your maybe the group that you're going to be interacting with or the person that you're going to be in conversation or meeting with or whatever the case may be? And I know you might say, well, Dave, I'm not a pastor the Holy, I, don't, I don't get to allow the Holy Spirit to plan my schedule. I understand what you're saying. You may have a job that you need to clock in for, a business that you need to manage, a family that you are tending to, but can I just say this to you today? In the midst of any and all of those things, the Holy Spirit has steps for you to take within that. And when we do that, when we do that, it changes the way that we interact with other people. At least I know it changes it for me. Because if I'm in my flesh, oftentimes when I'm talking with somebody, if it's just Dave... Sometimes I will be thinking, okay, okay, all right, okay, yep, yep. But if it's the Spirit of God, while I'm talking with this person, instead of me thinking this, I'm thinking, okay, God, you have me here for this right now. Is there something I can say, or do I just need to just stay quiet and listen? Is there something I need to do? And you know what? As I have those interactions, sometimes I may or may not say anything that's meaningful or helpful, or I might just listen. But when I get done with the interaction, my heart is just different than it is when, I'm, when it's just Dave, when it's just my flesh dealing with somebody. I don't know if that makes sense to any of you in this place or not, but it's just different when we are looking at the schedule, when we're looking at the appointment book, when we're looking at our calendar on our phone, when we're standing in front of that person, when we're interacting via email or text with that person, when it's just, okay, God, is there something that you can do here or that you want me to do here that can... Give you glory. 
because I want to walk in your spirit-led steps. And so maybe consider in the beginning of your day or the night before just saying, God, this is, you know what, I know I have to meet with these people tomorrow or I know I'm going into this site tomorrow. Is there something that you want me to say or do as I'm, go- as I'm going into it? And maybe it's pre-planned, or maybe it's on the fly. Maybe it's a bump into somebody at the grocery store, at the gas station, at the gym, or wh- wherever you are. And there's just, it could be a two-minute conversation. It could be a simple interaction. It could be a smile to somebody that could, because it is spirit-led in step, that it brings about change in somebody else. And you know what? Typically, when that's happening, it's also bringing about change within us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, great, incredible pastor, leader, author in Germany during the time of Nazi Germany, he said this, action springs not from thought, but from a readiness for responsibility. And so are we ready for the responsibility of spirit-led steps? Are, 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 we, are we posturing ourselves for that as we head into our day, planning the night before, planning the morning of? Can I just give you three quick things on, on how to make a, a simple tweak in your day in the direction towards spirit-led steps? The first thing is this, and it's the Sunday school answer. Pray. Okay, If anybody ever asks you a spiritual question that you don't know the the answer to, answer one of two things, Jesus or pray, okay? And there's a good possibility you're going to be right, okay? And so pray, just pray. In your prayer for your day, include this prayer, Spirit, lead my steps today. If we just, just pray that simple prayer, Spirit, would you lead my steps today, If it's the night before, would you lead my steps tomorrow? And as you pray, then just take a a moment and be quiet. And, And it's the second thing, listen. So pray and listen. And when I say listen, the Spirit of God may speak something to you, or you might have a sense of something, or you might see somebody's face flash before your mind, or there might be an email that you got from somebody two weeks ago, and all of a sudden the Spirit is like, you know what, you need to check in with that person again and just ask them how they're doing, or whatever the case may be. And you just sense that there's a step, there's a something that you need to do. And so we pray and we listen, and then the third thing, we go. We do it. Act. I guess I had four fingers up there. Do it. Okay. Go and do it. Because here's the thing. Spirit-led steps change people's lives. We see that in John 4 here in the story of this woman's life. Come and see a man who told me everything about myself. This, I think he's the Savior. Spirit-led steps. Jesus took spirit-led steps and they changed her lives. We can take spirit-led steps, and it will change somebody's life. We can make a difference in the name of Jesus. And guess what? It'll change your life, too. Spirit-led steps. Then we see in verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? So we have spirit-led steps, and then we have spirit-led questions. Jesus asked her a question. That's just how it got started. Will you give me some water? Can I have a drink? When we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus interacted with people a lot with questions. And this is something that the Lord has been challenging me in more lately, to engage people with questions. People that I know that I would be better at asking questions and people that I don't know and in, in getting to know them and getting to understand them and getting to connect with them, that I would ask some questions and, and some follow-up questions here and there and, and that I would work in questions that are spirit-led. The old 
great preacher Charles Spurgeon said this, if we would just cultivate the art of asking questions, we would find that gospel opportunities will naturally arise in the flow of conversation. If we would just cultivate the art of asking questions. Can I give you a very simple question to ask somebody that you already do, but I want to just encourage you to to just ask it spirit-led. Just pray, Jesus, would you just use this simple thing? How are you? Just ask that simple question. And then just wait. And just see what happens. Another question, is there something I can... Is there something I can pray for you about? They can say no. Or they can say, yeah. You see, the world that we live in now is so polarized in many cases, but leading with questions can help lower people's defenses. And so I'm trying to reach out in that way instead of with my own take, just leading with my own take on things. But with questions, we can understand more. We can connect more. Sometimes we have the opportunities to share the truth that's changing our lives in Jesus, through Jesus Christ. And I've got a long way to go, but can I tell you that one of the greatest things that stops me in this is just the fear of what are they going to think of me? If I ask that question, is there something I can pray for you about? Well, they're not going to think anything about you, Dave. You're a pastor. But what about when people don't know that I'm a pastor and I ask them that question? And so we can think, well, what are they going to think about me? What are they going to do? Are they going to just lock me out? Is it going to be awkward? There is so much to be gained in the Christian journey in being willing to push past awkwardness for a few moments that could change somebody's life or change our life. That happens in prayer, in responding to God, sometimes in stepping out of our seat and coming forward or putting up a hand and saying, I need prayer or saying, I need salvation in Jesus Christ or, or interacting with other people. If we'll just push through the awkwardness. I'm not saying that our goal is to achieve awkwardness and weirdness because Christians are plenty fine on that in our flesh. But if we'll be willing to endure a tiny bit of awkwardness for a bit, we never know what God might do in the meantime. And so so courage and the boldness, thankfully, one one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to give us courage and to give us boldness to step out and to share. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so questions sometimes have a way of opening people's lives. They can be doors for truth, encouragement, hope, change, sometimes salvation for somebody. It was just a short time ago, I was at some meetings up in the Twin Cities and, and uh, was staying in a hotel for a few nights. And, and so there were some of us from our group <clears throat> that in the mornings we'd go have breakfast before our meetings down in the hotel restaurant and and so we'd meet down there and have breakfast and talk. And we had a server, and she was our server for all three mornings that we were there. And we had developed a rapport with her and just talked with her. And she's bubbly and happy and great server. And, and it was the third day, and we were leaving. It's our last day. And as we were leaving the room, I was in the back of the, the pack of people leaving the restaurant, and as I walked by the server station, she was standing there, and I just kind of stopped. Everybody else kind of went ahead, and I stopped, and I I just had that spirit-led step, like just that, just kind of a little, like just stop and ask her if there's anything that you can pray for her about, and I was kind of like, eh, you know, (laughs) but what I have to do, something I'm learning more and more to push through the awkwardness. And it was, this all happened like in a split second. And so, so I was like, eh, okay. And so I stopped and I, I said to her, hey, can I ask you a question? She says, yeah. I said, is there anything I can pray for you about today before, I take, before we take off? Immediately. 
projectile tears start shooting out of her eyes. The tears aren't just dribbling down her cheek. They are shooting down her cheek, cheeks. And she said, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you asked me that question right now. My mom passed away two years ago this week. And it's been very difficult for me. And she is sobbing as she's telling me this at the server station. She said, it's been really difficult for me. And this week has been especially hard and so heavy for me. And so I just, I said, let's pray. And I, I just took her by the hand and said, Lord, I pray for my friend. It wasn't long. It wasn't elaborate. Lord, I pray for my friend today. You see her. You know her hurt. I pray today that she would know that she is deeply loved by you, that she would know your son, Jesus Christ, and that he would just be filling, that Jesus, you would be filling her up more and more, and that you would give her, give her comfort in her grief. In Jesus' name, amen. It's like 30 seconds. I said, thanks for letting me pray with you. And she's wiping tears off of her face. And she said, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I said, you bet. And I walked out the door. And as I'm walking out the door, she said, thank you. Thank you. And she's shouting thank you at me as I walk out of the. And you know what? None of that is because of me. It's just because Jesus wants to work through us. He wants to work through you. Dave, I'm not a pastor. I'm not called like that. That's okay. Jesus wants to work through you. Jesus wants to work through you in your office, on your team, on the court, in your neighborhood, at the gas station, at the grocery store. He wants to, to work through you in that meeting. He wants to work with you in that meeting after the meeting, in the hallway after the meeting, when something was off with that person, and you just say, hey, how are you? He wants to work in you, and he wants to work through you with spirit-led questions. Spirit-led questions change people's lives. And we never know what somebody is working through or dealing with inwardly. But I'll tell you what, the Spirit of God knows. And sometimes it's just a simple question that will draw it out. John 9 and 4, 9 to 14. John chapter 4, verses 9 to 14. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew And I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. We see the divide. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He's talking about himself. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And so I just want to pause on that for a minute. Uh, I, I learned about that particular passage right there that in ancient Jewish literature, not scripture, not sacred, but ancient Jewish literature, that uh, during the time when Jacob was, in, was giving this well to his family, that there was almost like a supernatural stirring of the well and it would bubble up and it would overflow to the point where Jacob would be able to drink from the well without having anything to draw from it. He'd just be able to, to, to drink from the well. And so it's quite possible that this woman was referring to that and saying to Jesus, are you greater than Jacob? And he's saying, yep. You're going to see in just a little bit here. And Jesus answered, verse 13, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Come and see a man. Come and see Jesus. Come and drink from the well. Come and experience the living water. Oh, man, do we live in a world today, in a society today, that needs living water. I'm going to ask a musician to come to the front right now. 
This last thing that we see for today in John chapter 4 is we have spirit-led steps, spirit-led questions, and lastly, spirit-led norms. Spirit-led norms. Dave, what are you talking about? Well, we have, we have social norms, and we have cultural norms, and we have political norms, politically correct, politically incorrect norms. But I want us to know today as followers of Christ that God has spirit-led norms. That as followers of Jesus, as people of the kingdom, we are to live our lives not in the cultural norms, not in the worldly accepted norms, but in the spirit-led norms of his kingdom, which is counter to culture in many cases, which is upside down to culture in most cases. And so we've, we've talked about the racial divide. There was some intense racial division at play between the Samaritans and the Jews. And these were social norms. They were accepted. They were politically correct. It was politically correct for Jews to hate Samaritans and for Samaritans to hate Jews. It was okay according to the system of this world. It was accepted. It was politically correct, even though it was wrong. But that's what happens when the world drives things and the church just follows along. It's not how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live instead with spirit-led norms. A.W. Tozer, another great old school preacher, said religion, religion today is not transforming the people. And he wrote this decades ago. Religion today is not transforming the people. It is being transformed by the people. In fact, I, I want this to settle in with you a little bit. I'm going to start over and read it again. Religion today is not transforming the people. It is being transformed by the people. It is not raising the moral level of society, it is descending to society's own level and congratulating itself that it has scored a victory because society is smiling, accepting the church's surrender. In this story and throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus was a lifter. Jesus lifted Samaritans and he lifted Jews. In this instance, we see that Jesus lifted this woman. And we see throughout the New Testament and through the Gospels that Jesus lifted women. And guess what? He also lifted men. We never see Jesus lifting one at the expense of another. Here we see him lifting the Samaritans to a place where he wants all Samaritans to know that they can experience the living water of salvation and relationship with God. And so we see Jesus lifting women from the cultural norms they were in. We see him lifting this woman who was likely hurt, discarded, possibly immoral, to a place of redemption, not because she was those things, not because she was discarded or because she was immoral or because she was possibly marginalized but because he is God because he is redemptive because the essence of who he is is that when someone comes to him with a surrendered humble heart he lifts it's what he does it's what he wants to do in you today it's what he wants to do through you and through your life. He's God. He's a lifter. And so we see Jesus lifting women and Jesus lifting men. Jesus lifting Jews and Jesus lifting Gentiles. He doesn't lift one by belittling another. It's the beauty of following Jesus. We don't have to treat each segment, each class, each race, each gender in all these nuanced ways that have become 
absolutely ridiculous in the society that we live in. And it happens even in the church, and the church, just like Tozer says, we, we as people start changing things. But Jesus says, no, he says, all people, one standard. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Live with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control for everyone. John 1, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So whoever it is, treat them with grace and speak the truth in love because grace without truth most of the time comes across, there it is, meaningless. And truth without grace, it comes across as mean. You see, one without the other isn't an accurate representation of grace or truth. But in Christ, the Redeemer, the Lifter, the one that no matter who it is, Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases, who lifts my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion. His name is Jesus Christ. Come and see a man. Come and see Jesus. Come and drink from the well of living water because there is no one like Jesus. There's nobody who's ever fought for you like Jesus. There's no one who's ever died for you like Jesus. And when we come and we surrender to his lordship over our lives, he can do with us as he wills. But my friends, it's always for his glory. And you'll find that your best is always hidden in his glory. Come and see a man. Stand with me if you would across this place. Jesus acted in spirit-led norms, not worldly accepted norms. And this is how he calls his followers to live. This world tries to create norms according to who and where and when. This world is always dividing and categorizing and labeling. Spirit-led norms are what are to be normal for the follower of Christ. And worldly accepted norms are to be abnormal to the follower of Christ. And so let's live spirit-led lives in step, in questions, and in the norms of how we live. We do not have to let the world push us around. We do not have to be gaslighted by the messages of this world. We can live in the truth. We can live in Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Take a minute with me, if you would. Close your eyes across this place. Heavenly Father, today, we love you. We thank you. We need you. Lord, today I pray that we would just put it on in our reminders, stick it on our calendar, put an alarm on our phone, either the night before or the day of. Spirit, lead my steps today, that we would pray it, that we would listen, that we would go and do and obey what you put before us. God, I pray that we'd push through the awkward tension just to ask a simple question. God, I pray that we would just get good at talking to people, just asking the simple ask, how are you? Is there something I can pray for you? to see what happens in the conversation for your glory. Spirit-led questions, steps, and norms lead to changed lives. 
And we want to see you change our lives. And we want to see you change the lives of others. Change eternities. Bring one more fully alive in Jesus Christ. God, use our lives to do it, we pray, because people are the only thing that we can take to heaven with us. I pray today that you'd be close to each person. There might be those. And I'm going to ask our prayer workers uh, to make their way across the front here. If you have need for prayer, when we finish this prayer, you can make your way up. But Father, right now I pray for those who maybe they feel <clears throat> like the woman at the well. Maybe they feel isolated or discarded or overlooked, talked about, betrayed, hurt, wounded. Maybe everything looks good outwardly, but inside there's this gap. Lord, today I pray that we would meet with you and drink of your living water and that you would change our lives. With eyes closed and heads bowed, we're going to pray this simple prayer of saying yes to Jesus and his salvation, surrendering our lives to him. That he's now in charge, and we're not. We will follow him. Pray this prayer of lordship with me right now, all across this room, loud and strong. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, I come to you. I've sinned, but you are perfect. You died in my place, rose from the grave. I believe that, and I trust you. I give you my life. I surrender all. Forgive me of my sins. I turn from them and I follow you. My Lord and my Savior from this day forward. Jesus, I thank you for everyone who prayed this prayer. I pray, God, today that you would carry it on to completion until the final day. We give you glory today greatest name, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. Amen. If you could hold tight for about 60 seconds before you move, if you made a decision to trust your life in Christ, right outside this set of doors, uh, on the counter to the left, there's a bunch of these books. It's a New Testament Bible for those who are new to faith in Christ. Take one with you. Begin to open it up and read it. Let Jesus change your life. Uh, if you're a regular, keep coming back. If you're a guest today, keep coming back. We want to help you grow in your journey with Jesus. Today, remember this. You are much loved. God bless you. Go with God. He goes with you. If you want prayer, come up front. If you want to get baptized, if you need to get baptized, head up to level two. Pastor Corey is up there to meet with you.